Okay, thank you, David. So and thank everyone for coming. So protein engineering is quite a broad topic and it means many slightly different things to different people. Um, I was looking, because I sort of remember this title vaguely from an article, a review by Jeremy Knowles in 1987. I thought it was old, but that's 25 years ago, where he talked about, he didn't want to use protein engineering. He talked about tinkering with enzymes. What are we learning? And I think we are further, we're further along 25 years later than that, though we're not quite at the point where maybe an engineer would really call it engineering rather than tinkering. I think we're, better, we're a lot further along. So the goal is to do predictable engineerings of proteins. And there have been some terrific successes, but there's a certain degree of subjectivity in protein specificness to those successes. And so in protein engineering, researchers learned from published data, but also, as you'll see from these three examples, go, they go into lab to actually make something new and to test it themselves. And in addition to testing fundamental concepts, then we're also making progress towards practical products. And I think Giovanni at the end will be talking about one particular example of that. But to start with, our first speaker is David Bednar, and he's going to talk about what are some web-based tools that are available to you and to tell us about how his group has used them to do things in the area of protein design. So over to David. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Bednar and I'm from Loschmidt Laboratories at Masaryk University in uh, the Czech Republic. And in Loschmidt Laboratories, we focus on protein engineering from different points of view, both like experimental and also theoretical. And in my team, uh, we focus on molecular modeling and bioinformatics and also on a development of computational tools which I want to talk about here also. Uh, in, in past few years, we have developed quite many tools. It's actually 12 tools and two databases, but there's not enough time, of course, to talk about all of them here. So I'll focus mostly on, on, on two of them, which will consider mostly design of protein stability. I don't think that I, I need to really go through the motivation much more thoroughly because uh, we all know that stability is one of the basic properties of all proteins. And if you want to use your protein in both basic science or, uh, or in some applied uh, technologies, you need to have proteins stable enough. And if you have stable proteins, they can withstand much uh, like uh, withstand very, very difficult conditions like uh, high temperatures, pH, and also additives like uh, denaturating agents and so on. Uh, concerning the methods of protein stabilization, I think we can divide it into three categories. First is calculating all the fold of the folding free energy, so based on, on some uh, force fields. Second, are approaches that are based on evolution, uh, like consensus designs or, or ancestral sequences. And the last one is based on machine learning, where you're trying to find some, uh, some statistical uh, interesting stuff in your data. I want to focus here mostly on the two first two categories. So the free energy calculation and the evolution approaches, because for both of them, we have developed uh, web servers that can be used. So first of all, I will start with uh, FireProt, which is the web server for engineering stable multiple point mutants. Uh, it's divided into two different strategies. And the first one is based on the energy approach, where you take your uh, protein, protein of interest, and you construct multiple sequence alignment from homologous sequences. You discard all the conserved and correlation, correlated uh, positions, and then you go for the, for the analysis by two different tools, which predict the free energy of unfolding. And these are Foldex and Rosetta. So we calculate all the possible single point mutants by these tools and everything that passes some uh, energetic criteria, some, some cutoffs uh, is, is going to the next, next steps. 
Uh, we also check some of the important interactions, uh, mostly like salt bridges, which we know that are not predicted well by, by these tools. And we also construct all the possible double point mutants to see if there could be some antagonistic effect to filter also some of these mutations. So all the mutations in the end that pass all these criteria uh, are then combined into the multiple point mutant, which has really a good chance to gather only the stabilizing mutations and discarding everything that could be, that could be tricky. Uh, we also saw that uh, these energy-based approaches or force, force field-based approaches sometimes fail to predict some kind of the mutation. So it's very uh, useful to add also some evolution-based techniques to complement the uh, mutations that you can find. <clears throat> so you start with the same protein again, and uh, then the difference, the main difference is that we don't calculate the free energy here, but we uh, select the mutations or create a pool of mutations by the back to consensus analysis. So we construct the multiple sequence alignment and we are trying to find those positions that are not conserved in your sequence, but we are trying to mutate them into the most conserved uh, residue in that particular position. So by that we, get, we have quite nice pool of mutations and then we go some uh, through some filters filtering steps as in the previous uh, case. So we uh, calculate some uh, destabilizing mutations by Foldex. We also check the interactions that are important. And in the end, uh, we provide the user with another multiple point Newton, which is based on this uh, different strategy. So altogether, this is the computational part. Then um, usually we uh, synthesize the genes and uh, we check them in lab. So we check the structure, stability, activity. If both uh, of the mutants are OK, then we combine them here into the combined multiple point mutant. But the workflow seems quite, quite difficult. You can see that it consists of uh, 15 different tools and two databases. So just installing and going through all the analysis is, is quite demanding. And for people who are not experienced in bioinformatics, this could be really overwhelming sometimes. Therefore, uh, we this decided to go also for the web server, which could be uh, easy to use with nice graphical user interface. So in the end, the only mandatory input for the FireProt is the uh, structure of your protein. So you upload it here. And then after uh, usually a few days of calculations, you get the output page where you can see the, the mutations mapped on your protein in this visualization window. And below, you can see a table with all the suggested mutations that should uh, have the stabilizing effect on your protein. <clears throat> to show you also that uh, the method really works. I selected a few, few of the proteins that we stabilized. Actually, uh, we stabilized already more than 10 uh, different proteins. But here are some, some of the selected halalkan dehalogenase, DHAA, um, the hydrochlorinase, and fibroblast growth factor 2. You can see that for all of the proteins, we were able to stabilize them for more than 15 degrees of Celsius. Uh, still keeping their biological functions. In first two, these are enzymes, so enzymatic function was conserved still. And in the third case, it was actually a very interesting case where uh, this is the uh, protein important for prolifer proliferation of cells, and it's used in, in uh, cultivation of stem cells. So this protein can be really used because his uh, half-life was increased from 12 hours to more than 20 days just by this computational stabilization. So this was the FireProt uh, method, which is very nice to use, but uh, it has one uh, disadvantage. You need the protein structure to work with this tool. And therefore, we also focused on development of different tool called FireProt ASR for ancestral sequence reconstruction. The motivation was quite straightforward. Uh, in the blue line, you can see that uh, on the scale, it seems like zero. There are almost no uh, 
protein structure. Actually, it's about 200,000 structures in PDB database currently. But on the other hand, there is almost a quarter of billion uh, of sequences of proteins. So uh, very often, when you want to work with some, some protein of your interest, you don't have your structure, but you can find the sequence and many homologous sequences. So sequence-based prediction of uh, stable mutations is, is very uh, interesting from this point of view. And here the ancestral sequence reconstruction can help you a lot uh, because it was proven in literature many times that, that ancestral proteins possess good stability. Uh, so this method is actually uh, based on phylogenetic trees, phylogenetic analysis, analysis, and I want to show you this nice tree, which was actually first one ever drawn by Charles Darwin. And from his time, we actually went a long way uh, to get this nice tree of lives where you can really observe the evolution of different groups, groups of uh, organisms. And as you can observe the evolution on the organism level, you can also uh, check the, the evolution on the protein level. So you can, you can actually gather homologous sequences from different organisms, and you can construct the evolutionary tree of proteins. And uh, then using the ancestral sequence reconstruction, you can actually define any ancestral protein in any node uh, from the evolution just by using some statistical most probable uh, sequences. So how does ancestral sequence reconstruction work? It's quite straightforward. You start with uh, gathering homologous sequences, then you align them into the multiple sequence alignment, and you construct the evolutionary uh, or phylogenetic tree. You can then select any, any node in the tree and you're trying to resurrect this particular protein. Uh, then you go from uh, into the multiple sequence alignment and on each position, you check what is the most conserved uh, residues based on some uh, evolutionary models, of course. So let's let's call it some weighted consensus. So you then go step by step on each position to really reconstruct your your ancestral sequence. Uh, so just to sum up, it's the collection of the sequences and uh, multiple sequence alignment, then the construction of the tree, and then reconstruction of ancestors. Uh, this work, workflow, of course, looks quite easy to do, but in the end, it was not that easy and straightforward because there are many, many steps that uh, needs to be done, and many of them need some manual input from the users. So uh, we actually spent uh, past few years to automate all these processes and, and to uh, build the pipeline uh, so it could be used really by, by people not experienced much in, in phylogenetic analysis. And all the, all the parts like sequence mining, filtering and data set reduction, multiple sequence alignment construction and the evolutionary tree, all these things were in the end uh, automized so, so it can be easily used. Uh, so in the end, this web server was, was uh, developed and uh, it, it looks quite uh, similar to the uh, classical fireprot with the only uh, difference is uh, where, where you can see here the sequence instead of the structure as the input. So just the FASTA format is, is enough to start the calculation. Of course, user can provide us with some other, uh, other information that he has available. Uh, after submitting this job, uh, usually after a few hours, uh, you can get uh, this kind of tree. Uh, so the tree of the homologous sequences of, of your protein family, and you can select any node uh, in that tree, and you can you can uh, visualize the the uh, sequence with all the posterior probabilities like you can see here, and also we build a homology model to visualize all the uh, differences between your wild type protein and this particular ancestral here in the visualization window. Uh, again, to prove you that this method is actually actually useful and, and can be can be used, it's quite robust. Uh, we applied applied it on on the uh, halalcon dehalogenase family. Um, more concretely, it was the DHA enzyme from Rhodococcus, 
and uh, we selected three different nodes uh, from from the tree always covering the query sequence uh, so we synthesized genes we went for the cloning and testing of the of the of the proteins in the end and you can see that all the proteins had quite nice yields uh, which is also very very common for for ancestral proteins you can see that all of them were nicely stable the melting temperature was increased for at least 20 degrees of celsius and uh, some of them have, have even like uh, increased activity uh, to the uh, to the double that that was in the uh, wild type protein so as you can sometimes hear some people say that uh, in past everything was better uh, in protein world uh, it seems like it's it's kind of true uh, so just just to conclude my talk uh, i wanted to show you these two tools for protein stabilization one is fireprot which is structure based method where you need the structure to to get the highly stable multiple point mutants if you don't have any structure, or even if you have, you can still uh, still try to use the FireProt ASR, which is useful for phylogenetic analysis and also for uh, for stabilize, stabilization of your of your protein just based on the sequence. All the tools we try to make really easy to use for for um, experimental biologists without the necessity of having having deep knowledge in, in bioinformatics and without installing these tools. Uh, so this is all from myself. I would like to thank all these institutions uh, for financial and computational support and also to our group of Flushmit Laboratories. And I'll end my talk here on this slide where you can also see some other tools that we develop. So if you are interested in in tools for analysis of protein and protein design, uh, you can go to this page uh, down here, Loschmidt Chemic Muni CZ slash portal. So thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer some questions. Thank you. That was terrific. I we have you can put questions in the chat or the questions and answers. I just saw another one. Um, I have I'm gonna read the odd one from the chat we're going to have more chance to discuss this at the end so this is an easy one from the chat with what what's your experience with metalloproteins or proteins that have got metals in them does everything you've said work equally well for them or are there any caveats with that uh yeah uh if you if you have some metal protein this could be uh quite problematic for the fire prod itself like the structure based tool because you need to you need to parameterize parameterize the, the cofactor and this is usually not not very easy and straightforward for 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 this automatic method so so it's not possible to to run it uh in in the fire prod itself but the fire prod asr doesn't care much about about the cofactors yeah those uh those amino acids that are like keeping the cofactor in place are are usually conserved so they are not mutated at all and and uh this uh, fibroid asr can be used even on metal proteins very easily okay i have one question which was what's going on with that node 238 protein you showed us which has a tm of 76 but then an activity of 30. do you, do you have any you must have looked into that because it's quite different from your other examples uh, with these ancestral sequences, you usually uh, have really a lot of mutations in your protein. Yeah, uh, it, it was usually tens of mutations that we that we constructed there, mm -hmm. uh, st still on the positions that are usually variable. Uh, the activity of of that particular node you mentioned is actually the same as on the wild type protein. So so there was no no problem with with the protein. It's just not as good as for the for the others. I actually and also some some extra slides uh, where where uh, we tested the substrate specificity of these ancestral proteins yeah. and those were quite uh, quite interesting because they have much broader specificity and usually we even see higher activities for some of the substrates yeah so so there's no 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 problem with that particular okay. node 
it's nicely stable and activity is fine. Okay. So I am just, we, I'm going to not read out any more questions. We're going to save them for our discussion at the end, even though we have a bunch. So keep putting them in people. I would like to move on. Thank you for a terrific presentation and for sharing those tools with the community. I'm going to move on now to Chris Wood, who's going to talk about um, how to rank designs and compare that with experiments. So I'm going to hand over now to Chris. And as I said, keep putting things in the chat. Hello, hopefully you can all hear me. Yeah, it's good. Is this, this little thing is go over here. Um, OK, um, hi, everyone. I'm Chris Wood. I'm a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. And my group's interested in uh, protein design and protein engineering. And one of the aspects of our labs is uh, evaluating protein design. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. So I'm going to start off with the, the big picture stuff. This is the group manifesto. It's what we're sort of aiming for. And this is a utop utopia built on protein design. And what we would like to do is to enable everyone to design proteins by the year 2100. And this is, uh, I really mean everybody. So maybe it's your doctor who's providing some protein-based therapeutic that you've got some unintended side effect from. And uh, you redesign the protein uh, in order to, to, to minimize that side effect. Or maybe it's a tailor who can tweak the properties of a protein-based materials like wools um, in order to make it more suited to a client's needs. Or it's maybe light harvesting proteins in some solar cells that needs to be tuned to the environment that they're being applied in. Or maybe uh, you know, pigments that an, an artist is using that they're a protein-based pigment and they want to, to change some of its properties to make it more useful. Now, these examples, <clears throat> they're tongue in cheek, but they, these are all areas where proteins are incredibly important at the moment. There's companies that are developing around all of these sorts of applications. But the, 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 the truth of the situation is that, that protein design is, is highly challenging. So it's, um, it's computationally expensive and certainly uh, you know, the more compute that you throw at the problem, I think the higher that your success rate is. I think that this is uh, uh, fair to say. Um, it's also, there's a, there's a very high failure rate design. So even in the very best protein design labs in the world, when they're applying these protein design, computational protein design algorithms at a, a large scale, um, it, there's still a very high failure rate. But very often it's around 90% of the designs that you that are, look good on the computer. In fact, that you can't tell the difference between those designs. You take them into the lab and 90% uh, of them fail for a variety of reasons. So some of them are insoluble um, and they, or they, they oligomerize in ways, the unintended ways, or they're functionally inactive depending on whatever their function is. So there's a high failure rate. And this is a huge barrier to entry because it means that the number of designs that you're testing, um, it's, it's going to be wasteful, right, with the, the, the resources you have. So this limits um, the, the, the kinds of people who can apply it. Um, it also requires a lot of very special skills. So um, computational analysis, maybe molecular simulation and other things. So if you're a molecular uh, biologist or something and you're thinking about approaches to solving a problem, protein design is probably not going to be the first thing on your list. So all of these things, I think, contribute, and other things, contribute towards protein design being inaccess uh, inaccessible and unreliable. And I think that we can address some of these, these problems in order to get some, some easy wins. So how is my lab addressing this? Well, um, first of all, we're generating new sequence design algorithms, algorithms which are computationally efficient and incorporate lots of information that make the designs more reliable, or that seems to be the case at the moment. We're developing and testing these at the moment. We're, we also uh, are developing lots of tools for evaluating working designs. And we're interested in, um, in, in also, all stages of that really sort of specifying what it is that you want your protein design to do in order to be fit for purpose, which is a challenging in itself, and then a way of trying to evaluate your proteins to see if it has this property. And then, um, and I'm going to focus on talking about that point too, and then as well, user friendly applications. I'll talk about that a little bit more. So, we want to make them as accessible as possible. So, whilst there's the sort of hardline, hard, 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 hardcore command line applications that people can apply at scale or on HPC. We also have user-friendly web applications that can do maybe 80 or 90% of, 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 maybe 20% that covers 90% of the use case. Um, 
Okay, so the work I'm going to talk about here, just a little tiny bit of the work that goes on in my group. And it was uh, mostly done by Michael Stam here. So as I've mentioned already, most design proteins that are experimentally characterized to be classed as failures for, for a variety of reasons. The, 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 another very interesting thing is that there's a good body of literature that's saying that it's actually very difficult to distinguish good designs from bad designs. So for example, in um, a paper from uh, Emanuele Pacci's group in Leeds, they looked at trying to evaluate um, Rosetta designs and they had, um, they had confirmations, uh, sorry, so they had confirmations for one design and they looked at the top 100 models, which they couldn't tell apart um, from the Rosetta scores. Um, and it, it wasn't, it's not like the number one design, the best ranked one was, was the, the successful confirmation that was adopted. It's very hard to distinguish those designs apart. So this is something we're interested in. Another thing is that, that I've kind of mentioned already is that the objectification problem is quite difficult. How do you say what it is? What properties should your protein have to be fit for a purpose? So you, if you're, you're thinking maybe about catalysis or some, uh, or you know, a structural protein or something like this, you can think about this, the, the, this end usage, but you've got to consider all sorts of things. Of course, to start with the, you know, the DNA construct and then how that's going to be translated in the environment and transcribed and translated in the environment you're working in. But how is that going to be trafficked? How is it going to fold? And all of these things are things that you need to consider. So there's lots and lots of properties. And as well as, you know, properties like the ones that David were mentioning, um, thermal stability, for example, maybe your, your protein would be useless if it, it didn't work at a particular pH, uh, pH range or temperature range. So we developed a de-stress, um, which stands for design structure evaluation services to tackle these this, these challenges. So I'll do a little demo of this here and hopefully it will go okay. So you can go to that web link that was there, destressprotein.design, and um, you go to this web page. And how it works essentially is that you uh, upload some designs that you've generated through whatever program. So uh, this could be Rosetta or, or anything, just they're, they're PDB format models at the moment, it'll accept. So let's just um, take some of these actually new ones. Um, and then you can load them up and they'll go off to our server and they'll run and calculate a whole bunch of metrics for them. And you can see that I've pre-calculated some metrics. These are just using existing uh, um, PDB structures um, for the protein data bank. And you can see that it calculates all sorts of different parameters and new ones are getting loaded in as they're finished there. Uh, and there's, there's all sorts of things. So hydrophobic fitness, these are either existing algorithms that we've implemented or using existing software to run these things. And it's a big meta scoring approach that we're taking. So statistical potentials, all atom force fields, um, uh, measuring hydrophobic fitness, um, measures of quality of packing, aggregation propensities. And the, the idea in the first instance is that we're not telling you which designs are good or bad. We're just telling you as much information as possible about your in individual designs. And you can, you know, click on these here and go in and find a bit more information about the particular protein and its sequence and then all of these parameters. And then um, for all of the, the, the all atom scoring functions, for example, you have each of the individual components. You can see this. We also have this um, other concept called reference sets. And this is a set of um, known protein structures, or they can be models that you've uploaded as well. And it calculates all of the metrics for these models and generates a sort of aggregated pool. And you can use this as a basis to compare your designs to. So for example, we've got top 500 here, which is a set of sort of high quality crystal structures, which were, uh, came out the Richardson lab um, uh, a couple of decades ago. Um, so you can see here, you can, how those structures compare to your designs. For example, we can see here that, um, you know, that what the EVF rank is or the DFIRE score and uh, the size of them, all sorts of things. And in, in fact, if we go back in and pick one of these, then we, we can get a bit more detailed information about how your particular de design relates to this. For example, looking at the relative composition. So you might be able to get an idea of the metabolic burden of your protein. If it's polytryptophan, maybe it's, it's going to be difficult to, to express or something like this. Um, as well, the structural space that's, that's occupied by the reference set, which is in the background here, so this uh, 2D histogram, and then uh, you've got the, the, your individual amino acids of your design there. So you can see, is it going into the right region of structural space or the, the region that you're expecting? And then you can compare the distribution of your designs, um, of your design in this black bar to the distribution of the reference set. So you can start to try, it's hard to determine 
what properties your protein should have. So it's useful to do this comparison to be able to, to see if it's likely um, if it's likely to be fit for a purpose. Um, and th the final thing is specifications I'm not going to get into, and this is a formal way of describing the properties your protein should, should have, and you can apply this to evaluate your designs. Now, like I said, we've got this accessible web application, but it, it's also you know, available on the command line and to, it's easy to deploy on local compute so you can run this at scale. And then I want to show you that, you know, it's not, um, hopefully uh, demonstrate to you that this is, it's likely that this is going to be useful. Now, a lot of the metrics we've included are standards like the Rosetta force field in, in, in computational protein design. So we know that it's useful for design, right? But we're hopefully, uh, I can show you that, you know, we've got an indication that it's useful and when you can mix together lots of different elements. One thing I didn't mention, sorry, is that if we go back here, we can export um, the, all the data from this so that you can go and interpret it and do statistical analysis on it, anything that you'd like to do. And it includes actually all of the component scores for each of these different um, force fields and whatnot. So when we go and look, what we wanted to try and, um, when we were publishing it, we wanted to say, look, this is useful. We can use it to distinguish good designs. And in order to test this, we compared it from, uh, uh, we looked at folding decoys. Now these are structures that have been generated to trick folding algorithms to test them. Um, and we looked at this one, this, this set that was generated by a program called 3D Robot, Robot that comes out of the, the Zhang lab. And these the stars are the, they're the, the known structure. Um, and then the decoys are um, well-packed, well uh, non-trivially identifiable um, um, structures that are not the thermodynamic minima, or, or at least what the structure is. And as well in squares here, we've got um, other structures of the protein or closely related proteins to compare to compare the, the sort of level of variability. And you can see here that we perform principal component analysis on a selection of the metrics, a subset of the metrics. Um, and then we can identify that the, the, the uh, folding decoys cluster together in a space um, whereas the known structures, the experimentally determined structures are, are up always in this, this upper uh, right-hand corner separate from this, this main cluster. Some of them are more distinct than others, um, but it, it's, it's, uh, from this point, it's trivial to identify these, for example. So you could use this to say, well, how, sort of, how likely is it that the, this design I've got, how good is this model that I've got, how much does it look like a known structure? Um, so and we did this work for 90 different structures. So now we're, we're, we're moving on, we're interested in antibody design and can we use the, these types of metrics to um, identify high quality design. Now, this is a engineering, especially in the final stages of generating antibody-based therapeutics. Very often what you want to do is do point mutations to your binder that you've identified through a high throughput screen. And we've been talking to a bunch of companies about this and very often there's a high failure rate um, on just generating those point mutations. So a single point mutation will lead it to misfolding or the massive reduction in, um, in, in the production levels that they can get, for example. So identifying this early on is very useful. And one thing that we were looking at is single chain um, antibodies. Um, and we, we, there's a lovely data set from the Fleischmann lab in um, Fleischmann in Israel. They have multiple design rounds of generating uh, single chain uh, antibodies. And it was starting with a scaffold for, for antifluorescein, and they optimized it in five design rounds in order to improve it. So this is how they look. You've got the light and the heavy chain, and they're joined together with this with a long linker here. And this is a, um, a structural prediction from half of both. So initially, Michael did some ana uh, analysis of this data set to try and look to see, you know, um, kind of how the designs varied from one another, whether there was sort of systematic variation. And you can see here that they, they had a measure of expression level, which is what the first thing that we were looking at to see if we could detect so that you could exclude ones that are likely to have low expression and never make those ones to start with at all and save yourself a whole bunch of money on DNA synthesis or get more designs that are likely to be successful. So they, they were determining expression levels using yeast display, um, sort of pr uh, pr protease resistance with yeast display. I think that's uh, the, the method that they were using. And uh, you can see there's an expression level that goes from uh, zero up to 80, um, 80 percent of the, the of the maximum fluorescence. And uh, you, it's not normally distributed. You've got a lot of low expression. You've got a sort of peak for high expression, and then a lot of stuff that's in between. And if you look at the expression across the design rounds, you've got the first round of designs had very low expression, and then the last one had very high. And in between, it's, it's sort of quite interesting. You've got uh, large variable sort of ranges there. 
And as well, there, the, just to point out that there is variation in the sequence length as well, um, because the, they change the linker and they change loops and whatnot because they were doing fragment piece. So what, what we are interested in is can we can we you know generate structural models for these, run them through, which is the stage you'd be at once you've done the protein design, um, and then run these through de-stress to generate some structural metrics to determine whether these are good designs or bad designs. Um, and this is this is this was the result. Um, we yeah, like I said, we generated them with AlphaFold and we calculated all these metrics and we did principal component analysis as well as some other clustering techniques such as UMAP and it sort of showed very similar results. Um, and you can see here that there's, uh, you get clusters of low expression. Uh, sorry, two seconds, I need to go on this filter so I can see. Yep, uh, cluster of low expression over here. And then you can see the high expressions in, in two sort of separate clusters and then the low to medium expressions all clustered together in the middle here. And what's really interesting is if you, if you go out and get uh, other known structures of say single chain uh, uh, antibodies, then uh, which are totally different targets, different, very different sequences, and then you compare them to this and they're under this natural, so natural is maybe the wrong word to use here, but known, known structures. If you calculate the metrics and compare them to these, they cluster together with the high expressing structure. So there's some information in the, in the metrics that have been calculated by de-stress that, that, that indicate that these ones are, these designs are going to be high expressing. Now, we're, a couple of things that we're looking at at the moment in the, in the lab, for example, we're using cell-free to try and determine why they failed so we can get a bit more information about what's going on because this is very interesting. The sequences are very similar, but some of them have very low expression, some of them have high, and we're trying to determine if we can figure out what is that's going wrong so we can change methodology, for example, to, to account for that. And another thing that we're doing is that, um, as, as well as using so PEC and UMAP, we're using something called Gaussian, Gaussian process latent variable models in order to be able to sample from a latent space and identify uh, new sequences that are, are close together um, with the, the higher expressing sequences in, in structural space, or identify if our designs would fall into those regions and use it generatively so that we can do design. Uh, okay, so that's just one little aspect of the work that goes on in the lab, but lots of other stuff as well. And um, uh, Michael Stamm, my student, did most of this work, and he's co-supervised by Ned and I, and Diego as well. So thanks very much. Great, thank you very much. We have um, not really time for questions, but I'll ask you one question myself, which is, have you ever analysed NMR determined structures? Have you ever run, rather than a, like a 3D robot decoy, have you ever looked at any structures determined by NMR? Uh, no, no, we've, we've not. That's a really good, um, that's a really good point. We've, we've kind of, uh, we've, I don't know if we've avoided it um, necessarily, but we've, we've not looked at them particularly. We have for lots of our design-based um, algorithms. And it's had to I, I ask that because in recent work, we found they look a lot like um, unsuccessful CASP things. So I was just wondering how they work. Yeah, well, this is, this is interesting because um, with, with, our, with our design algorithms, our sequence design algorithms, um, the, the quality of the structural prediction, the sequence predictions are much lower than on um, extra crystal structures, which is not so surprising. You see this with AlphaFold as well. Yeah, Structures. Yeah, yeah trained tra 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 on crystal structures. And I suppose it depends what we're aiming for. We're aiming for things we can crystallize and publish. So it's maybe not too much of a worry for us. But really, yeah, I think that it's a, a, a better, it would be better to identify, um, you know, soluble, uh, sorry, um, like at room temperature and whatnot and a uh, solution based. Uh, yeah, analysis. though I don't actually, well, We'll, we'll move on and we can bring this into the discussion. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. We're going to save all, some of these questions for the final discussion because I don't want us to be too rushed. And I want to move over to Giovanni now. And he's going to tell us about using deep learning to do design on what I would call a practical target for enzyme replacement therapies. And so this is like, okay, we've said in the past, we want to learn about how proteins work, which we're still doing. But here is an application of design methods towards a target that could actually be given to people as a replacement. So Giovanni, take it away. Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation. Really a pleasure to be here presenting some of the very recent work that uh, we have been doing in my lab, uh, which actually it's uh, working across uh, all the central dogma, I should say. Uh, we are really interested in uh, uh, genomics to begin with and specifically understanding 
readable component of cancer, but also we build genomes. Uh, we are part of the Synthetic Yeast Consortium. And uh, we have uh, moved uh, along the lines uh, to try to understand the gene expression at the network level, uh, both in disease and pathological states. Uh, and also we want to engineer expression by modulating uh, uh, the code and usage in E. coli uh, for uh, heterologous protein expressions. And uh, the new uh, projects we are really excited about is really uh, trying to engineer better enzyme replacement therapies. And I'll talk you uh, through uh, what we have been doing so far. And of course, this is not, not necessarily all my work, but it's actually the work of the amazing students in the lab who had taken all my ideas and made them um, are real, and also the collaborators that uh, are really making all the science possible. And uh, if you see something that you like about replacement therapies and synthetic genomics, so we have three postdoc positions, two uh, experimental and one computational uh, to start uh, almost immediately. So please do feel free to get in touch by email. So today we're going to talk about uh, engineering enzyme replacement therapies. As I said, this is really a work uh, led by one of my PhD students, a very talented, uh, a very talented mathematician who actually uh, embraces protein more now, uh, Evgeny Leobzaev. And uh, it's been a really great collaboration with Michael Herrera and Dominic Campopiano, who are experts uh, uh, in biocatalysis, and we share common interest in sphingolipids. So uh, we all know that uh, enzymes are proteins that catalyze almost every metabolic reaction required uh, for cellular life. And the problem is that when you have an enzymatic deficiency, uh, you get the accumulation of toxic level of substrates in the cells and uh, you get very severe pathologies. So if you look at the cell, you will see some of them are quite known like Gaucher disease, uh, Pompey, and a little bit less of Fabry disease. Uh, which we are really interested in. And the, um, the, the problem is that these diseases are very rare, usually affect the one in 40,000 newborn. Uh, but the reality is that the spectrum of phenotypes that they uh, encompass are so broad that the diagnosis uh, happens very late usually. And so it, actually these numbers might be very much lower. Uh, the end game of these uh, diseases is that you have uh, irreversible damage to specific organs. Um, for example, for Fabry, typically this means imp impairing your kidney function, uh, but uh, almost all of them somehow impair a heart uh, function, and some of them also CNS, which all it means that at the end of the day, if you're affected by one of these devastating diseases, your lifetime uh, is usually uh, uh, very, uh, very low. So how we, uh, um, uh, we are trying to uh, treat these diseases, unfortunately, you cannot cure them, but you can improve uh, the quality of life of patients and also uh, increase patient survival by basically uh, using replacement therapies, which is nothing more than uh, taking a recombinant version of the affected enzyme, uh, do an intravenous injection such that uh, the, uh, uh, you reduce the accumulation of the substrates in the cell. Uh, it's easier said than done, as we have seen in the literature, uh, because first of all, ERTs are very difficult to engineer. The enzymes are unstable in blood. Uh, they are difficult to deliver to in a tissue-specific way, uh, and also cause immune response, which is very important. But also they are difficult to manufacture, uh, because usually you use uh, mammalian cell lines, uh, which are typically prone to contamination, but also they are very low throughput. So, uh, of course, all this taken together is posing a really uh, big challenge to the uh, healthcare systems across the world. And uh, the solution for now is that uh, these drugs are basically categorized as orphan drugs, which has uh, caused some serious side effects, uh, meaning that their cost is uh, skyrocketed in the uh, last uh, 20 years or so. And if you look actually at the orphan drugs, uh, uh, the top of the most expensive one, the six out of eight are actually ERTs. So we gotta uh, sort of fix that uh, if you want. And um, I just started in uh, January uh, uh, the group project, which aims at doing three things in this area. Uh, first one is developing generative methods to design better ERTs. Uh, we want also establish a sustainable platform for uh, ERT manufacturing. And we also want to release everything as an open source uh, uh, platform because we think this will enable treatment for other uh, disease in this area. And uh, I have to thank the UKRI EBSRC for 
giving the opportunity through a fellowship to work on this for the next two, four years, but also my industrial partners who have been very supportive. So uh, how we actually engineer these enzymes, uh, I'm not gonna uh, cover the details, unfortunately, but uh, uh, Procrimity is coming out, uh, has been submitted to Biarchive, so it should be uh, out today or tomorrow. And uh, the idea is that you take a wild type sequence, uh, you retrieve orthologs, uh, you cluster the sequence to build data sets that we can use to train our uh, machine learning model, uh, which I'll talk in a bit. And after that, we use it to design new sequences, which go through a round of molecular dynamics simulations and sequence prioritization steps, such that we can pick the, what we think are the best candidates for actual lab testing. And so when, when we talk about uh, machine learning driven design of proteins, we are really talking uh, in our case about variational encoders. So what we think is that enzyme engineering uh, really means learning how to sample the protein design space to identify uh, the amino acid sequences associated with the desired catalytic function. And uh, our hypothesis here is that this design space is a statistical structure whose functional form of course, and corresponding parameters are unknown, but we can learn them from uh, the known sequences in nature. And so what we think is that uh, we assume that the probability of observing a given sequence depends on a, on a, a Latin uh, distribution, so of, of uh, unobserved features that um, basically condition the probability of observing any, uh, any sequence in this space. So when we look uh, at this, uh, we can replace this Latin distribution with one of the parametric that we routinely use. And I'll talk about uh, uh, we, the one that we are going to use here. Uh, and uh, we are going to model uh, the proteins uh, that we can generate depending on these values. Uh, using the language models. So typically these models are very difficult to fit, if not impossible. So we try to uh, get around that in different ways. And uh, we use a recognition model that we call the encoder so that we know which uh, um, distribution parameters are associated to what we know, uh, the uh, observed sequence. And then we use this other model to decode this numerical value into a natural sequence. Uh, how we do that? We use temporal convolutional networks, which allow us to uh, deal efficiently with the biological sequences and text in general. And how you fit this model, which sounds really complicated, and it is, uh, we use uh, uh, stochastic uh, variational inference, and specifically, we optimize the uh, evidence logger bound. So when it comes to modeling the Latin space, so the features inherent to uh, the proteins, uh, we argue that this is a very important factors when it comes to generating functional proteins. And in the literature, the common solution is that uh, people use a Gaussian distribution, which is not really well um, suitable for, uh, for, the, for this task because it's difficult to uh, um, model the multimodalities of the protein design landscape. And if you look here, for example, this is a very well-known picture. We thought uh, how which distribution could be better suited for modeling this scenario. And we turn to the Dirichlet function, which basically what it does is um, uh, modeling multimodalities as a, as a function of an alpha parameters. And with this, by modulating these parameters, we can actually uh, model different Bayesian attractions and different protein conformation uh, uh, in a very um, uh, uh, principled way. So this is one of the introduction that we did in the variational autoencoder framework. And we think this is uh, kind of the secret sauce for our uh, results. But what I think is uh, more interesting from a, a, an end user perspective, how you're gonna design a, a actual sequence, how you're gonna get them. So we have two strategies. One is called prior sampling, which basically generates a random number from a prior distribution for the, uh, the Dirichlet. And uh, we run through the decoder and it spits out a sequence that will look like one of the protein that uh, you have seen in the training set. So this is important. It's more like the novel uh, design, if you want. But if you want to generate variants, what you're looking at is what we call posterior sampling, where we start with a wild type uh, sequence. We run through the encoder. Uh, we get the region of the design space that, that uh, um, comprises this protein. And then we sequence in this neighborhood a new value that we can decode. And basically what we hope to find is a sequence that is very much similar to the uh, wild type, but with a few mutations in it. 
So we use this approach uh, to start working on um, sphingolipids, which is one of the class of uh, uh, lipids that we like the most. They are um, uh, very important for um, uh, especially structural roles in the cellular membrane. Um, there is a one that is particularly important. It is the uh, sphingosin one phosphate, a key molecule uh, whose metabolism is closely regulated. And one of the enzymes that is particularly important uh, is that the great S1P is the pyridoxal 5 prime phosphate dependent S1P, uh, which uh, we uh, are really interested in. And uh, as you can see, this is the a tightly a tight pocket where the uh, PLP binds. The problem becomes when you get a mutation in the gene encoding for S1PL, which has been re only recently shown to associate with the nephrotic syndrome of type 14. And uh, the uh, current solution that has been explored is to develop an enzyme as a replacement therapy that can uh, overcome the uh, uh, kidney failures, which all patients are affected of. So uh, the nice thing about this one pl is that it's present across many eukaryotes, as you can uh, imagine, and uh, uh, also has been shown by uh, micro labradors in bacteria. And the nice thing is that we have an enzyme uh, assay to test the variants in the lab. So what we found, uh, the first thing from a methodological point of view that's very interesting for us is actually our model generates more um, distinct and near wild type uh, S1PL variants, as you can see from uh, this plot with different type of metrics. But also when you look at these new sequences, you wanna make sure that they still retain the functional properties of the wild type, just to somehow have a proxy to say that they are functional. And so how we do that, we first of all look to whether our new sequences retain the catalytic residues, which is a lysine at position 353. And all of them, as you can see on the right plots over here, uh, retain the lysine except for five uh, um, sequences, which changes to training and valine. When you actually look at different um, indicators of protein properties, you will see that pretty much whatever we generate from the posterior distribution with our strategy actually retain the same like gravy instability index and isoelectric points uh, that we see for the wild type, which is uh, represented here uh, with uh, the dashed line. So everything seems to point into the right directions at least. And the nice thing to note here is that if you look at the samples that instead we generated from the prior, we see pretty much a big variations in these properties. Most of them are unfoldable protein or uh, um, something that you cannot uh, have in the solution. So that's uh, really showing that somehow our method is working. Um, of course, at this stage, it's all about sequences, but we know that the structure is really important. So uh, Michael did uh, an excellent analysis at the structural level where we mapped out all the mutations introduced by our machine learning method on the native structure of S1PL in human. And we find basically that everything is in or around the coiled regions and the pocket where a PLP binds is actually very much conserved. So this is really reassuring that pretty much our method is somehow learning uh, to not touch the functional region of these proteins. So of course, if we wanted to uh, go further and study how stable is the protein over time, we did molecular dynamics sim uh, simulations. And uh, what we try to see is how uh, our proteins evolve as a function of the RMSD uh, at each time step of our simulations. If you look at the wild type here, uh, this is uh, the so-called the 2D RMSD plots, you will see that the protein is very stable. But if you look at the, uh, uh, our variants that we selected uh, uh, pretty much a random within a bin between 90% and 100% uh, similarity with the wild type, we see quite a wide range of, um, uh, of uh, um, our changes in the uh, stability of the structures. And there's a one important thing to note that if we pick the variant which is the most similar uh, to the wild type is actually one of the most unstable, meaning that some of the mutations that we introduced actually were, even if they were just a few, were extremely deleterious. Whereas something that is a little bit more divergent, like here, it's actually more stable and it's probably one of the candidates we are bringing into the lab. So long story short, what it tells you is that um, you cannot just uh, uh, use the sequences to drive your design, but actually uh, using a 
filtering step based on structure will help you uh, or drive your designer towards more uh, functional regions of the design space. And finally, since we have seen that most of the structure is somehow uh, more flexible than the wild type, we did some factor analysis. Uh, this is the wild type. And when we compare it with the, what we think is the top candidate, we see that actually the most flexible regions are at the periphery of, the, uh, of our uh, molecule, which is uh, kind of what we want, is at least we know that uh, the structural component of our PLP binds is tightly packed and it's very much structurally conserved. So uh, this is where we are, and we are moving into the lab to test all these uh, new enzymes uh, in E. coli or, or potentially yeast, depending on which one reacts better, I would say. And uh, what we quickly realized is that uh, generative deep learning can really be a game-changing tool for designing ERTs. Uh, and what we think is going to happen is that we will be in the position of developing targeted libraries that will speed up uh, tremendously the time uh, to uh, bed of these uh, therapies uh, compared to standard the random mutagenesis experiments. Of course, it's not all gold what we see, but there are still mathematical and experimental challenges that we need to address. Like for example, learning from only few uh, sequences uh, in the data sets, which can always happen. Uh, how we incorporate in our sequence based model, actual structural and functional uh, properties, uh, but also how we test enzymes at scale. And I'll conclude by saying that we are really uh, uniquely positioned here in Edinburgh to do that because the Edinburgh Genome Foundry is uh, the most automated molecular biology, synthetic biology facility in the world, I would say, which is able to test 6,000 6, constructs uh, per year uh, in a fully automatic fashion. So with this, I'll conclude and I'll thank everybody and my sponsors for all uh, the uh, support through the years and I'll be taking questions.